the movement has been the same. People have been playing the game forever. There's nothing new in the movement. It is teaching. It's a new way to teach it. And, and listen, if the science of teaching, if that's a thing, if the science of teaching or skill acquisition hasn't improved enough to where we can use it to help someone get better, then what are we doing? Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. I am Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for being here. This episode is brought to you by Baseball Cloud. Baseball Cloud's revolutionary software platform brings to life the numbers captured by TrackMan and FlightScope. This provides colleges, players, and facility owners around the world a turnkey product, allowing them to analyze their data using key metrics and custom visualizations on one intuitive user interface. Go to BaseballCloud.com to find out how you can have your own data analytics department for your program. Data has a story to tell, and Baseball Cloud gives it a voice. Today, we have on Randy Sullivan, CEO of the Florida Baseball Ranch. FBR specializes in the development, management, and rehabilitation of hitters and pitchers. Before getting into baseball, Randy was a nuclear missile launch officer and decided to get into physical therapy, which led him to his current role in training baseball players. On the show, we discuss his concepts of linking hardware and software. We talk about constraints-based training and the differences between old school versus new school. Randy is also hosting the second annual Skill Acquisition Summit with some of the world's brightest minds on October 12th and 13th. I'll be in attendance and I hope to see you there. Here is Randy Sullivan. Randy, welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be here. Thanks. Of course, of course. This is round two for us, and I think we almost set a date to exactly one year since the last time that we got on the mic together. And I'm really excited to see what you've learned in the last year and and how can we can apply it in the team setting. But I'm really excited about getting to attend the Skill Acquisition Conference in a couple of weeks. And just for our listeners who may be curious, may have seen it on social media, you know, what are you putting on? What This is year two of that. And just tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so I guess this is like our anniversary date, right? We're going to have to do this again next year. I did freeze some cake <laughs> from the last time we were together. So. No doubt. Yeah, um, and so, and, and you've had a baby since then and all kinds of cool stuff like that. So oh, yeah. It, it, did you have your child already? Did you have your baby already? Oh, remember. yeah. Yeah, one oh. years old. Yeah, one years old. Okay, so anyway, uh, the Skill Acquisition Summit, um, we've teamed up with our friends from the Netherlands again, uh, Franz Bosch, Paul Vinner, Martijn Nijhoff, Bart Hunnegraff, and uh, Rob Gray from Shaky, uh, Shaky Weights Twitter. He's the uh, motor learning specialist from Arizona State University. And mm-hmm. Ron Wolforth, of course, and me. And we're all getting together again for another Baseball Skill Acquisition Summit. We hosted it last year, and we had 150 uh, attendees with, I think, 16 major league teams and about 53 guys okay. or so to come and hear sort of a new way to look at movement and how to apply movement science to baseball training. And so this is the encore. Um, You know, last year, I thought we made some great uh, inroads and and saw some significant changes that were occurring. People were going away from traditional, you know, one-size-fits-all model and traditional verbal cue-based coaching and kind of leaning more toward this idea that there is a science to teaching people how to move. And if you can harness that energy or harness that that knowledge and, and apply it on the field, you get some pretty powerful changes in people. And I think this year's theme is spot on. It is about how do we individualize training because the key to, to advance in any player's ability is, is to design and, and, and apply an individualized training process. Mm-hmm. And uh, what does that actually mean under our model of, you know, this, this dynamic systems theory and ecological design what, is, what does it mean to individualize? And I think that's been highly misinterpreted. I see, I see a lot of people implementing great ideas, and it seems like we're all about let's individualize, but to some, you know, uh, individualization means, okay, we got one guy doing dumbbell bench press, and the other guy's doing barbell bench press, and that's mm-hmm. not. And then to others, we have a bunch of guys running around doing differential learning drills where we're all in the lines, or running and jumping and doing crazy differential throws, which is, which is fine. And, in on the right circumstances but Mm -hmm. if you want to get the best return on your training time you have to use the best methods and you also have to match the training with the individual and and hit his target exactly what is it exactly that he needs to work on which is pretty neat to see and so 
we're digging deeper into the, the science of, you know, the, the physiology of how the body moves, the, um, the motor control component. We're digging deep into then how do we link together the training to match the athlete specifically. And that's what this summit is all about. And it's, it's pretty cool. It's going to start out on uh, October 12th. Uh, is that right? Yeah, uh, yeah the 12th is Saturday. And then um, we're, we'll, we'll do a lot of lecture in the hotel in, in, the, in, the, um, in the meeting room there. And then we'll funnel it down toward application. I love the way the summit is set up in that we ha- we allow the scientists to present the information, the evidence, and then we funnel it down with you know forward thinking coaches funneling it down to the point where second day is all hands on application at the ranch on the field mm-hmm. in the training room and and uh, in the bullpen. And so it, it's pretty neat the way we kind of just siphon it down to application because I mean academic without application is irrelevant in, in sure. the baseball world. It doesn't really help anybody. So yeah, we're excited about it. No, it sounds awesome. And I'm, I'm really excited to get to hear, uh, you know, all, all of the different Dutch speakers and obviously shaky weights is a fantastic follow and, and an mm-hmm. extremely bright mm-hmm. mind. And, and so I, I did mm-hmm. want to ask you though. So from you said, you said that you made some changes from last year's clinic to this year's clinic, but what are some things that you took away from last year and how did you use them within the last 365 days? Well, we, we learned a lot about, about, about the, the science of, of motor learning and how, how the body actually works. And I think, I think the biggest changes this year uh, from, from last year, last year was sort of the introduction to the concepts, the, you know, identifying what is important in the human movement and what is not, you know, what, what can be variable. And, and then I think that the, what we've learned over the past years is when you apply that, you really have to understand concepts like the perception and that, and that the truth of the matter is, you know, understanding that theory, you can't make someone move. I can't make you move. You can't make you move. Your coach can't make you move. The only thing that makes us move in, in time compressed situations is the sensory information around us. Um, we don't, we don't think our way through movement when there's time pressure, right? So if I'm, uh, I'm walking through a field and a bird is flying at, at you know, is flying off in the distance. Mm-hmm. If there's no time pressure, I use one sensory stream to kind of look at the bird and gather information, interpret what it is and walk around. And, and my mind can, my brain can tell my muscles what to do. And, and I don't have any time pressure, but when there's time pressure, like when the bird is actually flying at my head, uh, the bird actually makes me move. I don't, I don't look at him and gather information that would never survive in nature. Mm -hmm. Um, the bird makes me move. So a hitter doesn't look at the pitcher and, and gather information about him as he moves. And then, and then have the ball give him information to, to, so, and then he has to organize a swing based on what he perceives. It, 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 you can't, there's no time for all that. And so, Use a different sensory uh, stream, which is which is more of a primitive one that just says, you know, hey, I'm going to get into positions that maximize my my muscular qualities. My I want my I want to take advantage of all the elastic and mechanical properties, get myself into the most adaptable, adjustable positions mm-hmm. through my movement, and then and then, you know, as Augie Greta used to say, the late great Augie Greta used to say, let the ball tell you where to hit it, and and the baseball actually makes a player swing. You know, mm-hmm. it, it organizes a swing form, and so. That idea that that in nature, animals react in a cyclical uh, relationship with the sensory information that we move based on what we see and feel and, and hear mm-hmm. um, has been pretty neat to open up new doors on how do we how do we then manipulate that environment in training and take advantage of you know the, the idea that that we can use sensory information you know like things like the weight of the ball, the, the, uh, the shape of the object we're throwing, uh, the distance we're throwing from, the, the visual uh, input we get, our vestibular sense. And we can use that to guide our athlete toward more specific results. And so, you know, when you can, when you can match that, okay, what am I trying to get this athlete to do? What, do I, what does he need to do to perform more optimally? And then how can I manipulate his environment so that his body's encouraged to choose a different pathway? And that's been really cool to watch uh, us all kind of get together and put our heads together and come up with creative, innovative ways to, to help enact that. We'll be showing all that and the summit, especially in the hands-on session on, uh, on Sunday, the, the second day. So. 
No, I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I, I think that that's absolutely wonderful because I, I teach psychology and we talk about, you know, Daniel Kahneman's six, uh, system one and system two, but I really haven't, I haven't found a good way to teach it on the field. And that's not, you know, it's not something that's easily, and it's very heavy. And if you've read the book, I mean, I, I, I know that it's a long read and, and there are some very thick topics in it, but is that kind of what you're talking about? Absolutely. That is, that is the, um, you know, it's the, it, you know, you're, you have one sensory stream that, that, that kind of allows you to organize overall ideas and mm-hmm. come up with strategies and long-term plans. We use that every day in throwing, you know, and, 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 and in baseball, we use that system every day, but when there's time pressure, we kind of have to revert to our more prim- primitive sensory stream, right. which is you got to move, you know, like in, when there's time, like when you touch a slug with a stick, he moves, he doesn't, he doesn't have time to go, Hey, there's something touching me. You know, when, when, when we're in crisis situations, which is time pressure, basically in, in nature, we wouldn't survive if we had to interpret everything. Instead, we kind of have this direct interaction with our environment and, and, um, using that, that idea, you can change the information. And, you know, most of the coaches I know, and, and that, this includes you too. I, I, I think that many of the coaches that, that are getting good results or, or they're really are interested in helping their players get better. They've kind of been doing these things intuitively anyway. It's just that now we kind of give it a name and we, and we identify why it's happening. Okay. I know that you've probably experienced this, that for years you did something because it just felt right. Mm-hmm. And then the science explained it like, Oh, that's why that works. You know? Mm-hmm. And so I think that one thing we all have to remember is that coaches have been teaching human movements since the game began, mm-hmm. right? Since anything began. And so all we're doing is, is, is kind of um, refining the things that we're already doing and throwing out what, what we think may, may be corruptive or may not work and keeping some of the greatest things that are out there. So it's not like it's, not like it's anything new. People have been doing this forever. This is, not, this is nature. It's just sort of identifying what it is we're doing so that we can focus our energies and efforts more toward things that optimize the return on training. We, we, you know, we only have so much time. So. Right. Um, and that's, that's but, something that this fall, I mean, I, we have an hour, uh, every day. And so I get the hitters every other day and it's, it's something that we all had to sit down and go, okay, what, what is going to be the most efficient use of our time and what fits best in our system? What's going to help each individual player the most. And it's not something that's easily done. And it's something that, especially you're talking about that. I mean, I have, I am scared to death and I use this in a, in a way that it's in the, always in the back of my mind of if I don't do this well, if I don't do it efficient, and if I don't, Mm -hmm. if I don't help them, then I could ruin their career. Like that's always in the back of my mind of we have, we have this huge responsibility of we have to get them there faster. It's going to make them better. That's great. But if we don't and we make them worse, then it could end their career. And that's just, it's something that it's, it should be at the back of every coach's mind. But I, I, you know, I I say that in a way that it does like, I don't wake up going, Oh crap, I just ruined that kid's career or anything like that. But it's something that drives me every day. If that makes sense. You bet. You bet. And, and, you know, think about this. Okay. You're talking about hitting. Great. I understand you worry every day that you're going to make somebody worse. Okay. And hitting is probably more complex because you have to respond to sensory information and right. it's a little more complex than teaching pitching, but I would submit to you that you never had to lay awake at night and wonder if that kid was hurt because it's something that you might have done. Sure. So, so it's, you know, in their career, you might get them hurt. And, and there's always that, there's always that threat. And so you always trying to re- be respectful of that. And so, to get it right, we can't guess anymore. We have to get a more systemized approach. And, mm-hmm. and so one of the things that I think is really neat that has evolved uh, as of late, I'm, and I, I wrote about it a little bit in that, in that, um, that free ebook we put out about Scherzer and, um, and Berlin or comparing the two, is just this concept of linking hardware to software. So you, let's say you have a hitter or I have a pitcher in, in uh, one of my practice sessions. The first thing I need to know is how does his body want to move? You know, because I, you know, I've begun to look at things more as not as, as me trying to make a guy move or a guy, you know, choosing, changing the way he moves. I, you know, we want to optimize it by understanding, okay, what's going to be the most, the most efficient way for this guy to move. Mm-hmm. How is he, how is he going to move the best? And, to, and so you have to know some things about him physically, right? Um, if, if a guy's hips are internally rotated, uh, because he's he's pigeon toed like me, and he, he has what's known as antiverted hips. He's going to have to move differently than the guy who's sort of duck footed and his hips are retroverted, pointing outward. And he, you know, he um, 
he has a hard time with things like internal rotation. And so you can observe, there are some simple things that we'll show you at, at the summit that you can just observe the way people move and get really good clues without doing a formal uh, evaluation just by watching. And then if, uh, if you understand how their body's moving, then you'll be able to go, okay, the thing he's trying to do is working against against what his body in natural naturally wants to do. And so he's, he's getting this kind of, he's, and basically he's burning calories. We all have to move the most efficient way possible mm-hmm. in nature. We want to, we want to accomplish important goals and we want to do it. You know, complex organisms are inherently lazy. They have to be, they have to conserve energy. And so you want to accomplish these goals, but you want to do it in the most energy efficient way possible. And, mm-hmm. and it turns out that, that being energy efficient is being in good positions and being, and taking advantage of, elastic and mechanical properties of your muscles and getting yourself into a place where you can accomplish those goals and make it as easy as possible. And, and sometimes if we don't understand the guy's hardware, we might be getting him into positions that make it difficult for him to perform. An example would be, I, I tend to be, I'm, I'm kind of pigeon toed and, 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 and it served me well as a catcher when I was playing, but Mm-hmm. But I don't like external rotation. Like sitting crisscross applesauce in elementary school for me was treacherous, right? Because my hips don't like to go that way. I'm burning calories when I'm doing that. And so if you told me, like if you watched the Josh Donaldson video from several years back where he named three great hitters and said they all strided with their foot open, so everyone should stride with their foot open. Mm-hmm. If you told me to do that with the hips that I have, I'd have a hard time doing it. It would be really difficult. I could stride with my foot closed and still have enough internal rotation available to clear my hips without any problem. And then... And then, if, but you know, if you if you told a guy who's who whose hips loved external rotation to try with his foot close, then there there are a few options for him to pull it off. But you'd have to know that, and you have to know that about him, you know. Right. Um, and so that's sort of what we're going to do. I know it's going to be really exciting on on the uh, practical day. I'm excited because I'm teaming up with my friend Ron Wolfworth from the Texas Baseball Ranch, mm-hmm. and basically we're going to go through in our practical session and present. Ron will present a disconnection that we commonly see in throwing. And then I'll jump in and say, well, these are the possible physical constraints that might be holding this guy back. It might keep this guy from being able to, or might be making his body choose this way to move. Mm-hmm. And so we're going to kind of walk through that from, from toe to head during our practical and just kind of give guys, you know, really good hands-on simple things that you can observe to see what, how does this body want to move? How does this guy's body want to move? And what's the best way for me to help him optimize what he has you know so some of the hardware stuff the 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 tightness the things like that some of that stuff we can change and some is just the way you're made you mm-hmm. know right. you have to understand what can be changed and what should i change and then what, when i do how will it manifest itself in the movement and that's sort of that missing link concept i'm, I'm about three quarters of the way through a book on, uh, just doing just exactly that called the missing link and i think that's uh i think it's gonna be important to help people understand how do, how do you link the hardware to the software to optimize each guy's movement? Sure, I, I like that. And that's exactly, that's exactly what you're doing. You know, that's what you're doing every day, trying to figure out you know, what's right. the best way I can help this guy. So. Right. And something that I, I know you're on social media and I know that you see some po- people posting different things. And do you, maybe this is just me, but, and I kind of take offense to it at times, but do you see the Bernstein principle just getting used out of context all of the time? Oh my goodness. Like you wouldn't believe okay, I do. I do. I'm, I'm, I do. I'm, the only one. I'm actually, I'm actually, I, I just finished editing a video, a three minute video that I'm going to publish tomorrow about this. We, as an industry intent became everything and the body will organize itself in accordance with the goal of the activity. Right. Um, but the body won't always organize itself in the most efficient or most, or the safest way. It'll find a way. Mm-hmm. Right. And so we have to be careful. Go. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And, and, we have to be careful to make sure that we're doing it in the most energy preservative way possible because, you know, in nature in in one-off events in nature, bodies don't concern themselves with conservation of energy or being efficient. You know, um, in nature, when, when it's a one-off event, the body will organize itself any way it has to begin a time. But we forget that when we train, these are not one-off events. Like a throw, he has, he has to do this thing a hundred, 120 times a game. So he has to be, most efficient, most, uh, most, uh, connected and, and in the safest manner possible. Mm-hmm. And we, um, we collected a lot of data over the last two years. Um, you know, I have a full-time mathematician analyst that works for us. We've looked at over 500 pictures. And one of the things we're going to be talking about at our summit is, is that 
the data is really clear that there are there are a lot of ways to throw baseballs hard as hard. There's lots of different ways to throw it hard. But when we look at our algorithm, machine learning algorithms that we, that we put together to, to analyze this, there are only a very few ways to throw the ball hard and safe for a long time. When we when we compare arm health and injury and then velocity, and it, it, you know, you can throw hard a lot of ways, but there's only a few ways that you can throw hard and safe for a long time. And um, and so we'll be talking about that a lot at, at the summit too. And and so it's um it's exciting because I think people need to know it. I think that sometimes coaches are a little intimidated by you know the the science, the nature of the of the you know the discussion. It seems mm-hmm. over their heads and unusable. But truth of the matter is, it's really once you understand the language, once you understand the words that we're using, it's just like you know in the eighth grade when a kid was speaking pig Latin and he went sounded cool. You know, no one knew he They figured out. You're like, oh, I get it. That's not that complex. You know, uh-huh. um, my my computer guy and my my mechanic, they speak a language that I don't understand, but that doesn't make them more or less intelligent than me. Once and and actually, once you learn the language and looking at this movement that we're looking at it, through the prism that we are, it actually simplifies things. Once you understand it, it's like, wow, this this really allows me to target my interventions and simplifies what I have to do. So it's pretty it's pretty fun once you get through that. And I think that you know, I, if I could encourage anybody anybody listening, if you're intimidated by the words or if you feel like, wow, this is too scientific and and not practical, well, it is just the opposite. And you know, hopefully. Myself and, and Ron and Martin and Paul and some other guys that are there will be able to help you guys funnel this down into usable, actionable, practical ideas that will help your players get better quick. Oh, definitely. And you know, something that that I think that we all need to be conscious of too is is when we're using academic language and our players have no idea what we're talking about. We need to understand it well enough to be able to simplify it for them. Like that's that's a that's a whole nother yeah. matter at, at, in itself. But the communication piece of it, it again, it it we could be the smartest people in the world, but if we can't teach mm-hmm. what we're trying to teach, it it doesn't matter. You bet. You bet. And and you know what? You kind of have to understand this stuff now to pl- to reach today's player. They yeah. These players get accused of being they get accused of being lazy and 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 disrespectful and irreverent and they don't want to work and they don't want to work hard and they don't respect authority. What I don't see that at all. I see a bunch of guys, man. You come by one of our summer program days, you'll see some some dudes working their tails off. Okay. This just just generation of player is not afraid of hard work. This generation of players are afraid of things that they think are stupid. <laughs> and right. and they've gotten more information now than ever before. Right. And and I think that we have to respect that. And they're smarter than we give them credit for. They, they want to understand what they're doing um, and they want to understand why. And we got to be willing to explain it in ways that make sense to them. And I think that, I think we can do that. I think that's, I think if you can build that kind of relationship where you know the level of player you have and what he needs to know and what he doesn't need to know, you can hit that mark pretty well that you can say, look, this guy, this is what we're doing and here's why. And the idea behind it is this. And, the biggest thing is they and when it when you approach things through uh, skill skill acquisition science and use motor learning techniques, they're so liberated that they don't have to think about how they're doing it in the middle of the movement. Right? It's just so liberating to be able to go, okay, the the environment of the training is going to make the change, and um, it'll it'll happen subconsciously, and that's really cool because then they can just release their mind and move like like athletes that they are. Right, and and I read your blog the other day, a couple of weeks ago, uh, about your internal versus external, your old school versus new school, and and I thought that that was really really good. So, can you kind of sum that up for us and and tell us a little bit about that if our listeners haven't checked that out yet? Yeah, I think that you know, again, coaches have been ch- teaching movement forever, and we just have new ways of identifying what we're doing. And you know, I was watching um, MLB Network thing, or I saw it on YouTube or something. It was Pete Rose, the greatest, you know, the greatest the hit king, the guy with the most hits in the history of the game. And, you know, I actually sent this to my son who was playing collegiately, who was struggling a little bit. And, you know, he's trying to change his swing and he's trying to change his mechanics and he's trying to, you know, explicitly make these changes and it's not working. And I sent him this, this quote from Pete Rose who said, you know, look, when you're, when you're in a, when you're in a lull, uh, don't call it a slump. First of all, we call it a lull. And then he said, there's only six things you can do. You can you can move up in the box. You can move back in the box. You can move closer to the plate. You can move further from the plate. You can choke up, or you can move your hands down on the bat. And it occurred to me that that essentially all he's doing there is is changing the sensory information. You know, when you move a little closer to the pitcher, you get different sensory information. So the ball makes you move differently. If you move backwards, same. 
if you move forward, if you move toward the plane, away from the plane, and if you choke up and choke down, you're changing the feel of that. And the idea that you got to trust your training to have built this swing that puts you in the, in, into optimal positions to allow you the adjustability to respond to the sensory information in the most powerful, efficient way. And then all you can do is just change what you're sensing, change, change what you're perceiving mm-hmm. and allow that d- direct perception to kind of make your body move. And, and, uh, you know, I shared that with my son and he, he, he really grabbed, he really liked it a lot and it, and it helped him a lot. It changed, changed the last month of his season up there. And, and, and so I think that if we understand that really the way to change movement is through manipulating sensory information, I think we've been doing that forever anyway. Coaches have been doing that forever. And so I think that we don't have to get involved in the idea that, okay, I'm old school, I'm new school, I'm tech, I'm non-tech. I think we, we all have to remember that, that at the, at the end of the day, we're teaching movement and movement doesn't create data. Data create, I mean, uh, 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 data doesn't create movement. I'm sorry, I had that backwards. Data doesn't create movement. The movement creates the data. Mm-hmm. When you move, you make the technology record what you're doing. And so you can change the movement and thereby change the data. But the, simply having the data isn't going to change the movement. You, you, have to, you have to use the data as just something that's telling you how you're doing, you know, just telling you what we're up to. And, um, and so, and, and I think that, you know, we have to, of course, make sure that our athletes are, are, are moving in the right direction toward efficient moves. And, and, and we have to be real careful with this idea that just intent alone without any guidance, it's going to solve the problem. For us. So you're spot on there. No, I like that. And, you know, something this off season that I really tried to hone in on was my use of data. I mean, I, I am a, <laughs> I'm a one man show, I guess you could say at Union yeah. High School, as far mm-hmm. as collecting data and trying to use it. And, and so I started reading Fergus Connolly's Game Changer and man, he's, he's amazing. And there was one thing that, that stood out to me within his book and, and he, and uh, I'll just read it word for word as, as he talked about collecting data shouldn't start with what we can gather, but begin with what we want to achieve, then look for data that will impact that. And that freed me up so yeah. much because, you know, we're, we're talking about Blast or Flight Scope or Rapsodo, and you see all of these different numbers that you can use. But that quote, right, just that quote right there helped me hone in on, okay, what's actually important to us and how does it transfer to the game and then how can we use it? And I mean, that, that freed me right. up so much because it can be crippling at times when you're looking at all of the different numbers that you can use. Absolutely. And a lot of people are intimidated by that and they don't want to, you know, they just, they dig their heels in. They don't want to, they don't want to dive into it, but I agree. You can get lost, man. There's so much information out there. Our players are facing the same thing. There's mm-hmm. so much information on social media helping them sift through what's real and what's what, what applies to them is, is a difficult task. And the same thing with coaches, you can collect all the data you want. You know, I have all this big massive soup of data, but, but if it doesn't, you know, first of all, you're, you're spot on. And, and I wouldn't start with just collecting everything I collect. I would think, okay, what do I want to look at? What, is, mm-hmm. what do I think is important? And then, then the next step is, okay, I have this information. How do I use, how do I use movement science to change the outcome? And then the data will tell me if it, if, it, if it worked or not. And that's really the bridge that we're trying to, to, to close there. That's the, that's the missing link that we're trying to combine is, you know, we, ha- we have to get a few coaches like you who aren't afraid of either, either side and, and be able to, to, to provide that link for people to say, hey, this is what this means and this is how you use it. Because you can make it as complex or as simple. I mean, you never want to oversimplify things, of course, because movement is complex and humans are complex, Mm -hmm. but you, if if it just remains complex without application, then it's just, you know, it's just, it's just parlor tricks and, and, and mental gymnastics. It doesn't help us. It has to, it has to help us. It has to help us play better. You know, it has Mm -hmm. to help our player achieve its goals. And so I think there, there are people like you that are, I mean, it's so valuable that you're able to do that and then communicate with this form that you have to be able to spread the word that, you know, we can bridge these two things together, old school and new school and, and, and tech and, and non-tech. It can all be, I think that if we really look at it, we're kind of all doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. No, I, I a hundred percent agree. And, you know, I, I talk with my dad all the time. I, and for the listeners who don't know, my, my dad played eight years in the big leagues and, and we talk about the old school versus new school all the time. And I, I mean, I, I grew up in the more new school camp, but we have a lot of the same thing. I, I mean, it's it's just, it's so funny how similar that things are. And you've mentioned this several times on the podcast of, 
of we're all saying the same things in a lot of different ways. And, you know, like you said, you dig into one side or whatnot and you, you confirm your own biases with that. But it's just so interesting that like he even talked about weighted balls. He's like, I, I was in a bullpen in the Astros and their pitching coach in like 1967 or whatever it was, he threw me this concrete ball. And so that was, we just played catch with it some right before we got started playing catch. He said it would make our arms. There you go. And then everybody's like, right. weighted balls are a new thing. And he's like, no, I, I use that in 1967 or, you know, whenever yeah. it was in the 60s. Yeah. But but it's just it's right. just funny how, you know, it's it's it, baseball. And we talk about revolution ending and starting at the exact same point. But it's just it's just so funny where the pendulum swings. And it's always it for me, it's always somewhere in the middle. And it's we're we're coming up with new ways to teach things, but we're not teaching new things, if that makes sense, too. I, I say that all the time. It's a spot on statement. And it, re- regarding weighted balls, what's funny is like, you know, I grew up and we didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up. And we had, you know, if, if we lost our ball, we had to go buy a new one at the hardware store. And, you know, mm-hmm. so we tried to hang on to it as much as we could. And I think every ball I ever threw was a weighted ball because they all weigh different because yeah. sometimes you left them in the rain and sometimes they're older. So that, you know, and if you ever played a 9 a.m. perfect game tournament by the third inning, you were throwing a weighted ball oh, um, sure. because of the dew on the ground, you know. And, and the rooster tail going out of the outfield. So I think that, um, but, but yeah, you're right. I think that um, we, we're all saying all, basically the same thing. And, and, and I say this all the time. It's not that we're teaching you a new way to throw or hit. What we are teaching is a new way to, to, to view throwing and hitting, which leads to a new way to teach throwing and hitting. And I think that's the key is mm-hmm. the, the movement has been the same. People have been playing the game forever. There's nothing new in the movement. It is, teaching is a new way to teach it. And, and listen, if the science of teaching, if that's a thing, if the science of teaching or skill acquisition hasn't improved enough to where we can use it to help someone get better, then what are we doing? I mean, right. there are, there are more optimal ways to, to teach movement. And the trouble is sometimes people try to be different just to be different. You know, let's just be new so we can be different. And I think that you have to be real careful not, not to, you have to take both the old and the new and put it together because there are some things that people have been doing for a long time that were right. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason they were right. And so you can't just reject that. And the experiential knowledge of a, of a master teacher, you know, standing there observing and changing the way a person moves uh, through whatever means can't be, can't be cast aside. It's important. It's really important. Definitely. Another thing that, you hear a lot of, and that's constraints-based learning. And for, uh, you know, I, I luckily I get to have great conversations with guys like yourself on a weekly basis and they get to ask them to walk through some different things like this. But for, you see it floating around social media all the time. It's obviously an important part of learning and acquiring skills. And so for our listeners who are, are listening to this and, and they've seen it, but, you know, they, they want a simplified version or at least a simplified term version of what that is. And, and again, it, it sounds mm-hmm. really intimidating and it, it sounds intimidating to try and create all of these different constraints based on how you want your players to move, but kind of walk us yeah. through that a little bit. Tell us what it is and, and, you know, just kind of go through it for us. Yeah. Uh, at, at its most, at its most simple form is this, first of all, you have to understand that you can never repeat a movement that every single throw, every single swing is going to be different. And so, and that there's not time for you to cognitively change a movement in a time compressed situation. You mm-hmm you know, the, the, the math doesn't work out. So, uh, with, you know, um, I, I have this graphic that I posted and, you know, imagine that I'm the architect of a plaza and I want everybody to go to this one store that has good biomechanics, good food, good clothes, good everything. Right. And I design it so that I have a walkway and a breezeway and a doorway. And I expect the traffic is going to go into that walkway breezeway and then into the door and go into my store where I teach good mechanics and good, we get good results. But then I look out from my, my balcony, I look and there are people going across the street where they could get hurt. There are people going on the other side to another store where we don't agree with the way they sell, you know, biomechanics and food and clothes and whatnot. And so I have to put up some sort of barrier. In this case, if I put a hedge at the end of the sidewalk, then the traffic would hit the hedge and turn right and go into my store. And, and once they're in my store and their body realizes, man, this is the way I want to move, then I can begin to take the hedge away and mm-hmm. trim it back. And and then I just have to kind of tend the garden every once in a while to make sure the weeds don't come up. And so essentially a constraints led approach is figuring out, okay, what do I need this person to do? And then whatever it's doing that's screwing him up, I need to, I need to do something that keeps him from doing the thing that's messing him up. Mm-hmm. Or I need to do something that, that 
encourages his body to do something so much that he doesn't do the thing screwing him up. So it's really just two ways to look at it. I can just stop him from doing the thing that's messing him up or give him something else to do that's so powerful that he won't go toward the thing that's messing him up. Right. And, you know, when you have that idea, it's really not that complex. It's like, okay, here's what I see happening in this movement that's disrupting this guy's uh, results. Okay, what can I do that doesn't involve saying words to him that can... I mean, you can say words in the beginning and tell him what you're looking for. Of course, tell him the why. Mm -hmm. It's not like we never talk. It's not like we have sessions where we don't speak, you know? Um, And it's it's just that what you have to do is kind of explain what we're trying to do and then give him some sort of sensory information. So, for example, you know, um, the the little uh, connection club that that we came up with, it just adds a different feel to the way the arm is moving and it cleans up arm path pretty rapidly. You know, what can I do? You know, a shorter bat, a longer bat, a a different stimulus. I can, I can compress time. I can like simple example. Let's say that I want an athlete to find optimal length in his abdominals. He's not getting what people would call hip to shoulder separation. Uh, and then, and then turning that around. Well, you, you guys do it all the time. I see these shows where you're standing with your feet facing the other direction and you know, you jump into that position, you, you, uh, twist your torso back and you, and you immediately have to find your optimal length because of time pressure. So You just, what you have to do is just find a way to manipulate the sensory information to either keep him from doing the thing that's messing him up or make him more encouraged to do something else that, so that he won't do that thing. And I mean, that's really at its simplest form. And, uh, but to me, it it comes down to this. And and also this is something that we have to talk about too. In, in, in motor and skill acquisition, when people decide, okay, I'm going to go with implicit learning and, and I get this call or text all the time. Hey, what's a good drill for this? Well, the answer is there's no good drill for anything. Okay. A drill, I I guess there was a time seven or eight years ago when if you said to me, my athlete is doing this, what drill can I do? I would have answered, do this drill and it'll go away. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. Unfortunately, it's, it's, you have to change the way the guy moves. You have to fundamentally change his athleticism. You have to change his ability to find uh, optimal intention relationships and, and use co-contractions to maximize uh, output. And that's what we're going to be talking about at the summit. But you can't change a movement without changing the way the guy moves. Okay. Mm-hmm. You, there's, to me, the drills that we use are sort of the last little feathering. Like if we're laying concrete or a sidewalk, so it's the last little feathering in the front door. It's the foundation of movement. And that involves going back and digging deeper and going, okay, what physical presentation does he have? What What is his body going to like to do? What is his tightness? Where is he? Where is he not working well? How can we improve that? And then, and then what we do here at the ranch is just infuse that concept of, of movement into everything we do. It's in their warm up. It's in their, it's in their recovery drills. It's, it's in their throwing drills. It's in their hitting drills. It's in their, it's in their power workouts. It's in their strength tra- training programs. It's infused into everything. And everybody's plan is individualized based on our assessment to address those things and what we try to create is this entire movement experience and the entire movement experience changes the way the guy presents his swing or his, or his throw. And so like it's that. not just, let's do, let's do a drill, you know. Coaches, your players aren't afraid to work hard. They just can't afford to get it wrong. And that is why you should attend the 2019 Skill Acquisition Summit hosted by Randy Sullivan's Florida Baseball Ranch and the strength of skills from the Netherlands. This annual event will take place on October 12th and the 13th in Lakeland, Florida. This event will have a premier panel of presenters, including Franz Bosch from the Netherlands and Rob Gray from Arizona State University. The most forward-thinking coaches in the business will funnel the information down to the bare bones of on-the-field application of leading-edge skill acquisition and motor learning science. You will leave equipped to help your players optimize the return on their training time. For more information, call 1-866-STRIKE-3 or go to floridabaseballranch.com backslash summit. Presenters include Franz Bosch, Rob Gray, Martin Nyhoff, Bart Honegroff, David Mann, Paul Venner, Ron Wolforth, and Coach Randy Sullivan, who will serve as host and moderator for this exciting event. I will be in attendance, and I hope to see you there. I like that, and I I can't explain it as eloquently as you can, but uh, someone asked me that the other day, and, and I said, 
constraints can be as simple as just making sure that they understand the objective of, of exactly and the goal of what they're trying to accomplish with any drill that you give. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. a, that needs to have a conversation because we can set up drills and we can say, hey, just we're doing T work and we're doing this or that. But ha- having them to understand the objective helps them to understand the movement that it takes to beat you with that objective or to try and you can even make it a competition and i know it sounds really intimidating but you know Mm -hmm. we we Mm -hmm. do constraints all the time and we're like hey just you know like one of ours is with the underload bat they're having to try and hit it to the opposite field and so have a competition with with those guys and saying you know how many can you get with the underload bat how many can you hit to the opposite field that's that in itself is a constraint and they're having to feel through the movements without you saying just go oppo and so it's it's something that I, again, we can make it really simple. We can make it really complex. But for me, with working with fifty guys every, you know, mm-hmm. every other day, twenty five at a time to thirty at a time, the simpler is better for us. But not making mm-hmm. it like simplifying, but not ba- making it too much more simpler, if that, if that makes sense. And so, I think yeah. that that it's really it's something that that you have to give some thought into. But once you set it up and once you once you have them going, it's so much more efficient. Uh, use, it's so much more of a, an efficient use of their time because they're having to fill through everything and you're not having to stand over them and telling them whether it's wrong or right. The objective does that. And that's kind of the teacher voice coming out of, hey, we need to help these kids understand what the objective of every day of what they're doing in class. But it's the same thing whenever we're walking into a cage. They need to understand what it is that they're trying to do with every drill or uh, just the overall objective of the day, what we're trying to work on, and and let them get after it. I mean, that's that's what we've tried to do this fall, and I think that it's been uh, it's been fairly successful as far as buy in. It's been fairly successful as far as changes go, and so so we'll see. I mean, I, I, again, I love hearing you talk about it, and and so that's uh, that's just something that we've been trying to do as well. Yeah, thank God for implicit learning, right? Because if not, yeah. no one would ever get better in a team setting. No, I'd mm-hmm. have to have one-on-one instruction all the time, and I have to be bombing verbal cues on the guy all the time. So, sure. first of all, no no team would ever get any better, and no academy would ever be able to make a living because you'd have to have this one-on-one session that goes in depth, you know, mm-hmm. all the time. You'd never have group sessions. You'd never be able. So, thank God for it. But you know, remember when when you were a kid and there wasn't enough kids to play a game, and so you just put together a three on three game or something like that. And mm-hmm. what, did, what did you do with that? Okay. You got on the field. Let's say you're on even in your backyard. Okay. You'd said things like, all right, we don't have a right fielder. So if you hit the right field, you're out. Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. That's a constraint slide approach to training. You just, you just right. put a constraint right sure. there. It's as simple as that. It's nothing. There's nothing more complex than that. And it's, you know, sometimes the language you use has to be used because you have to describe, you have to explain what you're doing. You have to, you have to be able to discuss it in every Every discipline has their own language, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, my, my computer guy and my accountant both have their own language. But you have to have some sort of language to explain it. But it's not really that complex. When you, when you really pare it down, it, it can be as simple as putting you know, a, a, a bucket in front of the guy's foot so he can't do the thing that he was doing that was messing him up or something. Sure. And um, you know, the key for, for us, I think, is when you use constraints, is like I mentioned with the hedge, you trim the hedge away gradually, right? You, you, you gradually remove the constraint and you blend it back to the normal movement. And you try to, you can't just do the constraint drill and then not go do the real thing. You don't, you don't mm-hmm. do a constraint, a hitting constraint drill and then not hit, right? right? You, you blend that in so that his body learns to move that way. And if not, you're creating sort of apples, oranges, and banana swings, you know, like mm-hmm. every situation has a different swing. And what we want is a fruit salad where, it's all kind of mixed together. And so when you, when you use constraint led approaches to, to training, you have to realize that you have to then blend it back toward normal. It has to be kind of gradually uh, moved toward the normal movement and, and, and take away the constraint, take away the thing. Otherwise it becomes a crutch that we have to have. Well, and, and something else that, that, so I've started writing some different articles this fall and just trying to put my thoughts Mm -hmm. on pen and paper and no, you know, one, trying to help people in the team setting, because I know how, how daunting that it can be in a lot of these different subjects that we're talking about. But I started writing one about timing and it's, it's really hard to teach. Like It may be the most, the hardest aspect of hitting to teach that I think because right. I mean, timing right. and, and adjustability because all of it is implicit. Like everything that you observe yeah. around you is is per, uh, perceived in a different manner, and so just yeah. help me out. Like I I am I'm drawing straws and I feel like I've got a 
pretty good article base going. But at the same time, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how to teach it and how you guys are training it. Yeah, we, you know, it's funny because it's funny you said that because, um, you know, you, you, I, I didn't, I did know that you started writing and I was going to ask you about this because you think it's hard to teach. It, it, it's hard to write about. It's like, how do you describe what's happening in words, right? How do you put those words together right. to make, that makes make sense it clear without using, with me. without using some language that people, you know, there, you're going to have to explain it in ways that, that are pretty standardized. You know, you can't just say, move up, move down, move up, move down relative to what? I can't right. say move left, move right. You can't, you know what I mean? It's, it's hard. And so sometimes you have to use anatomical terms and things like that. So writing about it is even more difficult than teaching it. So for me, timing is, is about adjustability, right? Mm-hmm. That's what we're looking for. We need to be able to adjust to, to match the, the coincidence anticipation of the ball striking the back, right? That, mm-hmm. that moment where the ball, we need to try to match that. And so uh, I, I never really, talk about timing or, or speak about timing. But what I do try to do is get our athletes into positions that allow them adjustability, okay. get them into positions that, that, that optimize link tension relationships, teach them how to use their muscles uh, mechanically, how to use, how to get the most out of them and then teach them movements that put them in, you know, in good positions so that they can, that, that they can then allow the sensory information to tell them where to hit the ball. Right. So timing is, is without okay so and this kind of goes back to your Bernstein principle right mm-hmm. um, yeah, the, exactly. the 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 abuse of it okay I, I have a lot of players who come to us and they've been on um, in in academies where the whole session is let's get on the hit tracks and try to hit the ball really hard and really far and and you see that and they 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 can they can compensate by doing things like a quad dominant lunge forward and then lock their arms out and you can hit a ball far and, and you can hit it really hard that way. But sure. unfortunately when they start, when you don't know what's coming, there's no adjustability in that swing. Right. right. So, you know, it, you, you have to get into positions where, you know, you can, you can have adjustability built in. It can, you know, there are certain cogs of it. I think Bobby Tewksbury talked about that and I kind of, kind of, um, kind of, um, inherit or just incorporated that into our savage hitting program is mm-hmm. this idea that you have to have components of the swing that allow you the opportunity to make adjustments. You know, you have to get that those built in and then your timing can be adapted. But um, if you think about the concept of direct perception, okay, I'll get a little geeky here with some science, but you know, Gibson's direct perception theory talks about the concept of affordances, right? So mm-hmm. like if you look at a chair and your brain sees it and it's a chair, you know, the, 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 sensory uh, component of your brain that, that identifies objects for you says, yeah, that's a chair. That's what we call it. And you then sit on the chair and it, it's something, but if you didn't know the name of that thing, it would still be something that looked like you could sit on it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that chair affords you, invites you the opportunity to move. And affordance is something that invites you the opportunity to move. Mm-hmm. And so that chair looks sit onable, right. As would a stump in the woods looks sit onable. You know, I, I, I have this therapy table. I think I wrote about this. It sits out in our, you know, on the floor and I'm not, People aren't supposed to put stuff on it because it's supposed to be used for people that need sort of manual therapy or something like that. Mm-hmm. Every time I go out there, it has keys and drinks and, you know, clipboards and wallets and stuff sitting on it. And mm-hmm. I have to ask people to move it to use it. It's not that they're being rebellious. That horizontal surface afforded them the opportunity to put stuff on it. So that, sit onable. that surface was, that was put onable. It's like, I can put stuff on that, right? That's why every horizontal surface in your house has stuff on it because mm-hmm. it's all put onable, right? Yeah. If it was, who was slanted, you wouldn't put that something on it, right? And so if you think about a running back, puts his foot in the ground, and if he's really agile, he really understands how to find optimal length and co-contraction, and he looks for a hole to run through, if, if he's more athletic than another guy, the hole that he's afforded is smaller. He can get through a smaller hole, right? Mm-hmm. And, the, the hole, and so that, that hole is get-throughable, right? And then the guy who's not as athletic, who can't remove muscle slack, and can't find co-contractions, et cetera, which is what we'll be talking a lot about at the summit, but if it, this, the, the hole that he runs through has got to be bigger. So his, his affordances are fewer. He has mm-hmm. to have bigger holes to be able to run through. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's based on him understanding himself and his anatomy and, and how he moves. When you think about a hitter, you know, well, how can a, how can a major league pitcher turn around 105 miles? I mean, a major league hitter turn around 105 miles an hour. Well, when you move so well, then more pitches are presented as, as hittable. They, they afford you the opportunity to hit them. If you're a bad mover who jumps out on his quads and locks his arms out, there are going to be very few pitches that you would be able to perceive as hittable, right? 
But if you move well and get yourselves into positions that optimize link tension relationships and have the cogs of adjustability built into your swing that allow you to enter the hitting zone through the back so that you can have more time to, to make to, to more movement solution space, more space to make uh, the changes that you need, then those pitches become more hittable. And when people talk an old school thought of the game slowing down for these guys, really because of the cyclical nature and the cyclical relationship that we have with perception and action, as you move better, you perceive better. And as you perceive better, you move better. And so these guys who can turn around nasty stuff in the big leagues, they're just such elite movers that they become elite perceivers and they are afforded more pitches that appear to be hittable. And so we got to try to get our guys to move better so they can perceive better. I love that. And, and you walked right into my next question, and that's trying to couple perception and action as much as I can this fall. And there are some times that we as coaches are constrained by time or space or weather or things like that. And we have to do, you know, the stand in bullpens where they you're not allowed to swing. You're able to perceive the information that's happening and you but you can't you can't uh, act upon it. And so what are some different what are some different ways that we can merge those two? And I, again, this is something that, that if you could take some of the, some of the natural old school, I don't want to say old school, but just set things that a lot of coaches do such as stand in bullpens and how can we make them better? Yeah. How can we, how can we take the perception or the action piece and make sure that those are coupled together? Yeah, I am. Um, that, that's a really, that's a really tough challenge in hitting. I understand. And that's why. Hitting is such a more complex thing to teach than pitching because of the pitching. You got one guy throwing, you can throw it to a target. A pitcher doesn't need anybody to help him get better. A hitter needs somebody to throw it to him or something to throw it to him. And so you're right. This idea of coupling perception with action is, is really important. And, you know, ideally what you'd want to have is, uh, of course, we have to use things like the T and of course we have mm-hmm. to do things where we're just learning to move better. Sure. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but once the movement is, is reasonable, as soon as we can, we start adding the perceptual component and that is on toss. And then, you know, coaches, so what I, you know, what I always call 40, 40, 40 batting practice, the 40 year old guy throwing 40 miles an hour from 40 feet. Mm-hmm. And, and that's all good, but it's not, it's not it, right. Right. Alongside of perception and action coupling is representative design, right? You have to have it look as much like the game as possible. That's why it's hard. And that's a challenge because there's just not enough arms out there to do it. You know, right. If I had to do it again, and I've coached travel ball for a long time, coming up with my younger guys, as ugly as the practice would be, I would have them throw to one another to make it as, as real as it could. And I would do my drill work and my movement work on the side. But at the end of the day, everybody would be facing a kid, one of their teammates. You know, remember back at, at the Citadel when I played, we didn't have a graduate assistant. We didn't have any assistant coaches. And so, the, you know, the freshman pitchers, the guys, you know, our coach never cut anybody, but the freshman pitchers, they, they threw from 60 feet, six inches live batting practice every day. And it was more realistic. And looking back, you know, he was doing it out of necessity because we didn't have enough guys, but they didn't bring him up short and have him throw. He threw him from 60 feet, six inches, and it was more realistic. It was more um, perception action. So here's, here's a really good example. My friend Kyle Wagner was down here for three weeks, oh, um, kind of helping us. Oh yeah. He's, I read a book that he wrote on hitting uh, called Green Light Hitting. Green Light Hitting, yeah, that's uh, a great 2000, book. Yeah, he, he he wrote it in 2012, and I, he showed it to me in like 2015, I think. I wasn't even ready for it when I read it. And then I read it on New Year's Day last year, just kind of found it in my computer, and I was like, oh my gosh, this guy was so far ahead of me yeah. back then. And so he came down, he spent three weeks down here working with our hitters, working with our hitting coaches, trying to integrate those two systems, and it was really neat. And a simple drill that I saw him do to improve perception, perception, action coupling was he had the pitcher throw into a screen with the hitter standing behind the screen. Okay. And, and so the bullpen was to a catcher, but the ball was hitting a screen mm-hmm. and then the hitter could go ahead and take a full swing at whatever he perceived <laughs> awesome. without hitting the ball. Yeah. So, I mean, it was really simple, you know, so sure. it, it's, it's, it's a good way as, as good as we can get, obviously, you don't get any of the tactile feedback from making contact, whether you, you know, whether you got vibrations off the end of the bat or off mm-hmm. fists, but it is, it is getting closer to that idea of coupling perception and action. And, um, at our place, we don't use very many, we don't use the pitching machine very often. We have a home plate pitch machine that is sitting in there collecting dust because, um, much to the chagrin of my CFO, 
anymore just because we paid heavily for it, as you know. Sure. But it just sits in there because it doesn't, um, it, 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 you know, the machine doesn't present the same information, the sensory information as a live picture. I would, mm -hmm. I think I'd rather have a coach at 40 feet mixing things up. Like, and, and basically what we do is we, we try to, in any given session, and I got this idea from Ron Wolforth, okay, in any given hitting session, we want 15% of our swings to be against the fastest pitch we'll ever see. We want 15% to be against the slowest pitch we'll ever see. And we want 15% of our swings to be against, uh, to, with our two strike approach. Okay. Um, and then the rest of it is going to be variability. The, the, the other 55% is going to be variable. Um, it is going to be, and the variability and the unpredictability of each one is going to be added in relation to the quality of the mover and, and the advancement of the player. So if he's still not moving well, we're clearly not going to overwhelm him by carving him up in those 55% of throws. He'll know a lot of times what's coming until he becomes a little bit better mover. And then as his swing gets better and gets more of the components in it, then we gradually add more perceptual adjustability through different distances, different pitches, you know, different, uh, you know, our, our, our pitchers won't tell the guys what's coming. We'll just mix them up, try to get them out basically. Mm -hmm. Um, different, you know, we'll do three plate drills. We'll do different, uh, weighted bats, different, you know, variable stimulus just to try to change the sensory information as much as possible during that, that, that 55%. And that is sort of the amount of variability we add into that segment depends on where the guy is, you know, what level he's at. And, we kind of label those guys level one, two, three, four, five, and see, you know, we kind of categorize them, say this group can have this much variability. This group can have a little more variability. And some of our most elite guys, when it's, you know, that 55% that we're dealing with, and we're, we're not telling what's coming. And, you know, our, our analytics coordinator throws 87 from the mound. I don't know oh, if anyone wow. knew that. He throws 93 on a running throw. Yeah. He's a kid that hardly ever played high school. ball. I played a couple of years, got hurt. And then in college, he didn't play at all. But when he got here, he asked me to write him a training plan. He started training. But, you know, he said, I think the data will mean more to me if I experience the training. I'm like, I think we got a winner here, right? I think we got a good guy. And so he's, he's gotten better. He does running throws at like 95 now. And he throws 87 from the mound. And Jordy from 40 is dirty. He is dirty. He is like his, it's like his World Series to carve these guys up. He takes mm -hmm. great pride in it. And, and so, you know, when, when we have a guy who's an elite mover or elite, he has, he has a really good swing and he's, and he's performing well, you know, at the end, he's going to face Jordy, who's going to try to carve him up and make it really difficult. And there's a lot of failure in batting practice when that guy's throwing. So, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's, it, it's about to me, perception, action coupling. It, it can be as simple as just taking what you're already doing and for example, just add that little screen in front and then take a real swing, take a whole swing. Mm -hmm. And then. Just understanding that that I mean it's 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 not reasonable to think that on every single thing that you do in batting practice you should have a ball that represents what a pitcher is going to throw to you mm -hmm. as part of your training. That that right. doesn't seem reasonable to me. That seems like we're going to get kids that are overwhelmed and we're going to get frustrated. We're not going to make progress. I think that you have to nuance that and say, all right, as the guy becomes a better mover, then we can add more perceptual adjustability to to the situation. And, Ultimately, you know, if, if I was coaching a college team or a major league team, I would, I would, I would have a cadre of batting practice pitchers that would throw live to my guys as sort of the, as sort of the feathering toward the end of the side, like an icing on the top, you know, like, you know, let's make this real. So. No doubt. I, I need to give Kyle a shout because we actually, we actually do the same thing. And that was something that, that I wanted us to help with better decision-making. And so, but we yeah. actually do it with the machine just because you know, we have guys that we we want to slightly overtrain, or, or in your instance, you the fifteen percent of the fastest fastest pitch you've ever yeah. seen. But this could yeah. be very hard on thumbs and on <laughs> confidence too. If if this is if this is you know the first couple of times that they've seen it, so I really like it yeah. for you know making sure that because our hacks. I mean, sometimes I'll throw it in the dirt, and sometimes I'll throw it right down the middle. You never know. So that's been really good for right. us. And without the the pressure and stress of actually t trying to hit the ball every single time, so they focus on moving and seeing it better. And I really like that. Yeah. Or or we'll sit like a slider at the very bottom of the zone. And can you? I know I know the spin is different, and it's through a screen. But can you recognize when it's too low that it's going to break out of the zone versus when it's actually going to fall into the zone? So I really encourage the 
listeners to try and try that, especially when, and you can do a lefty and righty at the same time. You just move them away from the plate a little bit too, which is really cool. But I do have some lightning style questions for you at, uh, before we end it. So what's the latest thing that you've learned that you are really excited about? Oh my goodness. Okay. So the, the big thing for me is looking at movement through the natural evolution of movement like like why what is the body going to want to do instead of instead of looking at it as i'm going to make this guy move this way the idea that his body's choosing to move and why is it choosing to move in this manner and what are the reasons for it to be disconnecting why might the body be disconnecting here and how can we then solve that problem for him so that's been that's been great um been doing so much studying lately on 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 Gibson's uh, ecological approach to visual perception, just understanding the concept of direct perception and how we move based on, you know, the, the environment directly and not mm-hmm. through some interpretive uh, system. And, and so that's been exciting. And then learning, you know, and just understanding that, that what I'm, what we're doing here is a, a, a 360 degree movement based experience that has to be targeted toward each individual's needs. And we have to link his hardware to his software and help them optimize what he can do. And when we realize that, okay, the drill isn't the, isn't the end all be all, it's the movement that creates the ability to perform the drill well, mm-hmm. that then results in the better performance on the field. That has been critical. You know, we, we wrote, I wrote Savage Training as a, as a strength training book uh, a few years back, and it turns out that Savage Training is actually in everything we do. Specific adaptations and variability and goal-directed experiences is. Mm-hmm is what savage is an acronym for and, and it's and it's everything it's it's the whole 360 degree thing every time we're trying to teach a guy to hit or throw better we're trying to teach him to move better and the way we do that is by understanding this uh dynamic systems theory understanding this uh direct perception process and understanding that the you know combine that with the the, the understanding of the anatomy and the muscle physiology and you really you can synthesize a process that allows you to zero in on and get specific adaptations that really pay great dividends in, in, in the guy's performance. So that's been really exciting for us. Perfect. I love that. And I know you, you are not anti-drill, but you uh, have a ton of different dr- uh, drills in your toolbox for some different things, but mm-hmm. what's something that you guys do in training that your players just can't get enough of that they love to death? Okay. Um, once they understand what they're trying to do, this idea of trying to feel a co-contraction of, you know, muscles around a, a, a joint or limb when they all kind of co-contract to give you what we call angel dust or PCP, power control and protection. Okay. Uh, it, it, when your muscles co-contract on, under optimal link tension relationships, you can, you can amplify the power. You can amplify the, the amount of motor control you have and you protect your joints well. And when they understand that's what we're after, they're, they're, I see them all around the room trying to find co-contractions in space constantly. And, and so that's been fun. Um, they, they really like, they, they like uh, a lot of our new tech that we have. They like when our guys advance to the point where they can do pitch design uh, and we use our electronics cameras and our, our uh, 40 motion sensors. And we have this really cool, oh, we're going to show this at the summit. You'll be, you'll be stoked about seeing this. We have this really cool force plate sensor mound and hitting pad that is linked to 200 frames per second video that allows us to see ground reaction forces in real time relative to really the, jealous uh, right now. the actual movement, which is really cool. It's so cool. It's so cool. And, and our, and our friend, one of our, one of our students, uh, is one of his father owns an aeronautical engineering company that builds airplane parts and they decided they were going to get into this world. And Kyle Barker gave this to us to use. He just said, I need you guys to, to, to observe it, use it and, come up with protocols to help use it as a training tool because right now it's just a really cool piece of data collection. So mm-hmm. we've been so blessed to be able to work with that and have fun with that. And so that's a lot of fun. And then, um, and of course, you know, our guys, when we get into more competitive bullpen situations or when they're, you know, challenging each other, and anytime there's competition, you know, that's always great. And so, um, you know, we have given away free shirts for the guy who can throw the ball the hardest or can hit the target the most time and stuff like that are, I guys really enjoy that. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, it's a lot of fun. And so we try to create, you know, I created this uh, competitive bullpen game that I'll show you at the summit. It's called, it's called bull shots. And it's just a, you divided the teams and it's, 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 it's like a version of horse, but it's, you know, and my friend, uh, uh, you know, Kyle Wagner is my friend, his brother, Brett is sort of a tech guy, right? They're mm-hmm. twins. 
And he actually turned it into an app that's on the player's phone so they can compete. They can join teams and compete in, in sort of their, their bullpen, the competitive bullpen league, you know, so that's kind of neat too. Um, really cool. So they get a kick out of that. And, and, you know, we've been using VFlex a lot. Uh, you know, um, we started looking at movement disorders like the yips and things like that, which some people, you know, kind of have labeled as a psychological disorder. And you being a psychology major, you'll appreciate this. We began to review it as just a movement disorder. When you start to understand sensory information, when you start to understand direct perception, you begin to look at this thing called the yips as a movement disorder. Because if if in a time compressed situation they're moving based on the sensory information that they're getting, then whether real or perceived, the reason they're moving the way they're moving when they get the yips is because they're getting bad sensory information. Right? Mm-hmm. They're they're getting lots. And so I have you know you we talked about the two different sensory streams. And I think I have this theory that one thing that I think might be happening there is that that sort of half speed throw that they make, you know, when most people, most guys with this problem, they can throw hard. They can't throw soft, right? Mm-hmm. They can't do a three quarter speed throw when you, but when there's time pressure and they, they pick up a ball and throw it, it, it works fine. And mm-hmm. so I think maybe what might be happening is they might be caught between the two streams, the, the, the ventral and dorsal streams so that they don't, you know, they're, they're not using either one, you know? <laughs> And mm-hmm. so we've had a lot of success, especially using V-Flex, just by changing the sensory information. Hmm. Having them throw at different implements, throwing clubs, throwing football, throwing running throws, throwing, you know, run one way, throw the other way, doing a lot of differential learning, and then in them on the V-Flex, because the V-Flex, you know, essentially just changes their sense of space and time, and it just kind of changes what, what they're seeing and how they're viewing the thing they're throwing at. And so we've had a lot of success you know, using that and then weaning guys off of it to, to try to teach them to throw better. And so that's been exciting. You know, when you get a guy with that kind of, uh, that kind of problem that he's facing, you know, one of the things that, that kind of bothers me, and I think that we all need to kind of step back and take a look at it is in baseball, it seems like in, in hitting is the same way, right? It, it, it's when, a, when a player has a problem, it's mechanical until it's not right. Right. And then it's mental, right? It's mechanical until it's not, and then it's mental, like because he didn't get what I was teaching, so he's got a, he's a head case. He's not really tough. He's mm-hmm. he gets nervous. He's afraid. I I, I kind of got to back it down and go, man, come on. I, I, he's tough enough. He wouldn't be here at practice. If he wasn't tough enough. Okay. I think that I think that we have to find a better way to teach this guy. You know, we have to find a better way. And we've had a couple kids that came to us with you know this kind of movement disorder and. And one of them just went to go play for the Royals. He got picked up by the Royals to go play. And, I'm, you know, we don't, I don't know how it'll go when he gets up there. I hope it goes well. I think it's going well here. And I told him the other day, I'm so glad that after he got released from one team, that he didn't quit because that kid's going to go through the rest of his life thinking he has a mental disorder when really he had a movement disorder that if we could have solved it with uh, skill acquisition science, we could have changed his life. And, it, you know, this thing's always been bigger than baseball for me. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the life lessons you learned along the way. I know you feel that way too. Right. And so when you take a kid like that and you can change not only his tra- trajectory of his baseball career, but possibly his life, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to draw him it up, but you know, you get a kid that thinks he has a mental disorder. What happens when he's facing a stressful situation in life, you know, or an emergency with his family or something, does he, does he freeze because he thinks he has a mental problem or, you know, and so I think we all got to back off on this idea of labeling kids as mentally soft and, labeling them as having mental disorders i think i think if we just view them all as movement disorders i think they're solvable sure no i i love that and i don't think there's a better place to end it than that as far as you know we started with we want to make sure we're doing everything that we can to advance a player's career and, and ending with that and and you know it it if any of our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about the Skill Acquisition Summit that's coming up in a couple of weeks, what would be the best way to do so? Well, easiest way is to go to floridabaseballranch.com slash summit, S-U-M-M-I-T. They can learn all about it there, find all the details. And then you can always call us at our really cool uh, eight, no, 800 number. It's 866-STRIKE-3. <laughs> 866-STRIKE-3. That's 866-787-4533. Um, and uh, they can call it and ask Amy about it. She'll tell you all about it and, and uh, tell you all the details and, and get you signed up. And so if you're planning on coming, hurry up and sign up because the thing's going to fill up and uh, it'll tough and only handle so many, you know, so many seats. So well, hopefully we'll get, you know, we'll have a great time there. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing you there. It's going to be exciting. And uh, 
sharing some ideas with you. And especially my favorite times though, the summit's great, but all the conversations that go on afterwards mm-hmm. are what it's all about. You know, we stay around and we ha- we all eat at the hotel and hang around and, and have this, those just really insightful conversations that stimulate thought. And mm-hmm. that's really what I'm the most excited about for that. So. Definitely. And I, I know Amy is amazing. And so she has done an awesome job every time that I've wanted to interview you of, of being in, in touch. So I wanted to give her that shout out too, but also, I, I really appreciate all of our conversations all the time, and they're, they're truly enlightening. And, but uh, is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go, Randy? Um, I, I would just like to tell them that, that you know anyone can do it. Anyone can become anything they want because God doesn't make junk, and human tissue doesn't have free will. Every single player has the potential to get better. Every single player, if we get the training information right, their body will adapt. And so... You know, I know you believe that too, and I want to just take a minute to thank you for what you're doing and this this thing that you put together to spread the word and and just the the approach that you take and the compassion you have for your players and and your willingness to dig in and learn and and seek out information. And I know that you do this because it's kind of cool, but I know you also do it for selfish reasons because you kind of want to learn all the time. And so you just figure out a way to to tap into the to some of the uh, some really. Uh, some really forward thinkers and, 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 and you're one of those, man, you're, you're there and, and I see what you're doing and I, you're doing great work and I'm really happy for you and really proud of you. So keep on, keep on doing what you're doing. Bud. Thank you for listening to ahead of the curve. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, which can include Apple podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please share it on social media to help get the word out. Once again, thank you for joining us.